turn to the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. And um, with the Lord's help today, uh, we'd like to take a couple minutes if God would uh, see fit to touch and bless uh, this time. I sure appreciate uh, the Bible, uh, teaching the Bible lesson uh, this morning from our dear brother, Brother Myers. Thank you uh, for, for what God used you uh, to bring to our hearts today. And, um, Definitely some uh, some helpful truth and um, some truth that we need to be reminded of. We really do. We thank God for that, brother. I really do. If you have your Bibles today, though, I'd like you to turn uh, to Luke chapter 1. Look here at verse 26 in just a moment. Now, I was talking to Brother Hibner, and he had mentioned that his desire was to have a Mother's Day missions message. And um, I, I think this is the first time I've ever preached on Mother's Day. It's very hard for missionaries to find a place to preach on Mother's Day. So I count this a great privilege, brother, and I give God the glory for it. And we're going to do our best with God's help uh, to preach a Mother's Day missions message. And you know, you begin to look through uh, mothers in the Word of God, uh, it, it's really not hard to find uh, some great examples in the scriptures uh, of mothers. And so if God will help us, we're going to preach on missionary mothers today. And uh, missionary mothers. And just be prepared, we're going to be looking through a couple uh, passages of scripture. And we, by, before the uh, morning's over, we may have been reading the equivalent of about three chapters of the Word of God. And I know for some of us that will be more than we've read all week. I hope it's not. <laughs> but, but I hope it's not. Um, Brother Rooster, boy, I mean, you can just see the end right there. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but, not more than we've read all week. Um, but God has left us with some tremendous example of missionary mothers. And you say, Brother Samuel, what is a missionary? And, and, and I imagine, you know, it's, it's sometimes easy to, be t to, to take um, terminology and really, I mean, we don't know what a missionary is. Uh, but it's amazing the word missionary uh, is not found in the Word of God. So therefore, we have to kind of rely on man's uh, mindset and his thinking and his teaching to really define what a missionary is. Um, but God lays out the principles, just like the word rapture is not in uh, your King James Bible, but the doctrine of the catching away of born again believers is. Uh, the word missionary is not in the Bible, but the doctrine and uh, the principle of a missionary is found clearly through Scripture. A missionary, uh, mainly, uh, I guess the greatest, the greatest way to explain it is someone who leaves their home uh, to go somewhere uh, where many times they may not be receptive. And uh, place and leave uh, family, friends, the comforts of life, and to go somewhere else, and to go to someone else that has never heard the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Someone who leaves their comforts, who leaves their comfort zone, who leaves an area where they are accepted, where they are received, and goes to a people uh, who they really do not know, goes to a foreign land, and leaves it all behind for the sake of God's will in their life. And when we look at this matter of missionary mothers, um, you know, I, we just would have to start um, with Mary, the, the earthly mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Lord Jesus is the greatest missionary uh, that has ever walked the face of the earth. I venture to say he's the first missionary. You think about what Christ did as he came to this old earth. He left the splendors of heaven. He left the glory. He left all of the, all the admiration, all of the wonderful a splendor of heaven. And he came to a people who really and truly did not want anything to do with him. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The world didn't care for him. His own people did not care for him, the nation of Israel. But yet he came to a group of people uh, fulfilling the will of God for his life. God became a man. He humbled himself, uh, and he took on the form of a servant. And um, that is the greatest example of a missionary. Uh, leaving, dear friend, those comforts and taking on that form of a servant and saying, Lord, I want to do your will. Uh, but in order for Christ to fulfill uh, the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, God said, Behold, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, Amen. and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so in order for that to happen, there had to be a mother of the Lord Jesus. And not just any kind of 
find a mother, uh, there had to be a special woman who would uh, be trusted by God and entrusted uh, by God himself to carry the Messiah. We see here in Luke chapter 1, we're looking at the wonderful thought of missionary mothers today as we focus here. Uh, and this dear congregation is making your mission focus month, but yet today is Mother's Day. So we look here at verse 26 of Luke chapter 1. The Bible says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came uh, in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this would be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be seen? I know not. Amen. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born in thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she had also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her that was called Mary. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me, Amen. according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary rose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias. And so even Elizabeth, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe left in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy women, whence is to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe left in my womb for joy, and blessed is she that believed. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit rejoiced. In God, my Savior. Yeah. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done great things, and holy and ready, and holy is his name. And so we see right here in Luke chapter 1, really, we see two uh, mothers that would uh, bear uh, the greatest preachers that ever walked the face of the earth. John the Baptist, there in the womb of Elizabeth. She was uh, of a great age. She was barren. She couldn't have children. And God had miraculously allowed her to conceive John the Baptist. God said, from a human standpoint, uh, from genetically speaking, there would never be a greater born than John the Baptist as far as a preacher. Now the Lord Jesus Christ, the blood in his veins, that was a virgin birth. There was Mary. And right. there would never be a greater. There would never be another Messiah that would be born. And so you have the right. mother of the Messiah, and you have the mother of the greatest preacher preacher that would ever be born. And they're both meeting together here in Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to talk about a, uh, you talk about just a wonderful experience. Oh, yeah. You talk about a joyous experience that these two women, uh, one of them uh, would have been looked upon as too young uh, to bear a child, the other too old to bear a child. And you look at both of them and both they're carrying some of the greatest yeah. preachers that would ever walk the face of the earth. One of them, the son of God, the belly of dear Mary. And then you have John the Baptist in the belly of Elizabeth. And they meet together. And Mary spends some time up there in Judah in the house of Zacharias with Elizabeth. But we see here that, that during this time and during those days, because of the prophets, because of what God had written to Daniel, because how God had pinpointed the exact 
time frame that the Messiah was to be born in Daniel chapter 9, the leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, the rulers, they knew that the time was drawing near for the Messiah to come. And it would have been the aspiration and the desire of every young woman of that day that maybe, just maybe, God would allow me to bring forth the Messiah. God promised that a virgin would conceive. God promised that he would be born. A son would be given. His name would be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. But maybe, just maybe, God would use me to bring forth and to bear the Messiah into the world. Mary makes the statement that all nations, that all people would call her blessed. It's all and from henceforth shall call me blessed. She looked upon this as the greatest blessing that could have ever been afforded. But you see, God came to Mary. He did not choose anyone else, but he chose Mary. Now, we have some, we have some indications here of what God was looking for when he was looking for someone to carry Christ and to bring him into the world. We do know that in the next chapter that Mary did bring forth her firstborn son, laid him in swaddling clothes, laid him in that manger, and she carried Christ until he was born. And what an awesome responsibility and a privilege that it was. But we see some, we see some attributes, we see some character traits here in Mary as God was looking for someone that he could trust to carry his only begotten son in this matter of missionary mothers. And look, let's see what God uh, was looking for in the mother of the greatest missionary to ever walk the face of her. First of all, we see in verse 27, and you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of religions today and a lot of religious folks that make a great deal about Mary to the point to where you can't even see Jesus. Mary is so magnified that you cannot even see Christ. God never intended for Mary to be magnified. Mary never intended for Mary right. to be magnified. We read that here just a minute ago, and we'll look at it again. But there were some things about Mary that made her qualified to be able to have this wonderful privilege of carrying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, God could have chose anyone, but for the Hebrew, there, there was a reason why God chose Mary. The Messiah's name was revealed. Mary's name was never revealed. Right. It could have been anybody. It could have been Joy. It could have been, it could have been anybody. But it, there were some qualifications, though, that whoever it was that would carry Christ had to uh, fulfill. And here is number one in verse 27. The Bible said uh, that in Galilee, uh, and we read verse 26, just catching up here in the angel, uh, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth, verse 27, to a virgin, to a virgin, a spouse to a man, a spouse to a man, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the virgin's name was Mary. First off, she was a virgin. She had kept herself pure. She had kept herself clean. She had kept herself sanctified for the service of God. And you see, there may have been a lot of young women that day who wished they could have borne the Messiah. But dear friend, they had not kept themselves pure. They had not kept themselves clean. First off, we see her sanctification. She had lived a clean and a biblical and a godly life. She was doing things right. She was living according to the pattern and and, and the requirements that God had laid out. She was a virgin. God would have never sent Gabriel to someone who was not a virgin. For God had already laid the groundwork that it would be a virgin that would conceive. That was the sign. That was the wonderful precursor that they would know this is the Messiah. Here is a unmarried woman that she is bearing uh, a child. And she's not just an unmarried woman, but she is a woman who has never been with a man. And God said that she was a virgin, a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, that marriage contract had been signed, but the marriage had not happened yet. Right. And of course, we won't take the time to, to get into the reason for all that, but that Jewish custom of marriage was a little bit different than the way it is today. But they're planning the, the, the marriage, they're planning the wedding, but they have not come together yet. And so we see in verse 27 the sanctification of this young lady, but in verse 38, so we go from 27 to verse 30, and we read it just a minute ago, and Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy 
work. And not only do we see the sanctification of this young lady, of this mother of the greatest missionary, but we also see her submission. Yes. Oh my. She said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Not only was Mary living a clean and a sanctified life, but she was living a submitted life to the will of God. Once the angel of the Lord explained to her that the Holy Ghost would be the one that would come upon her, and that that child that would be born of her would be called the Son of God, you have to realize immediately in the back of Mary's mind she began to consider the reproach that would be attached to her because of carrying this holy child. Yes. She immediately realized that there would be ridicule, that there would be mocking, that there would be folks who would say things about her that weren't true. She realized that there would be folks who would make fun of her. There would be folks who not only would make fun of her and talk about her and say uh, horrible things and think the worst of her, but there would be folks who would reject her and want nothing to do with her. But she said, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me. Yes. According to thy word, Lord, whatever your will is, thy will be done. She was submitted. But then I take what I like most of all in verse 47. She said in my spirit, now she begins to testify. If you can kind of see some encouragement comes in the life of this dear mother as she begins to fellowship uh, with Elizabeth. And she begins to have a little bit of a better picture of what really is taking place. But she gets up there under the mountains there and she gets up there with Elizabeth. And Mary said, my soul is magnified the Lord. Verse 47, 47 and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Not only do we see her sanctification, we see her submission, but we see her salvation. Yeah. I'm glad that Mary had found a Savior. Now listen, here's some qualifications to be this missionary mother. Yes, she had to be, she had to be sanctified. She had to be set apart from God. God wasn't just going to use some run-of-the-mill person live a life however they wanted to. And, and God wasn't going to use someone who was not submitted to the will of God. But first and foremost, Mary had to have a Savior. She had yeah. to be saved. And it's amazing how many times our folks are so full of religion, but they never found salvation in Christ Jesus. And Mary said, my spirit have rejoiced in God my Savior. It's amazing how uh, Catholic folks, they want to pray to Mary, but their friend Mary needed a Savior just like you and I need a Savior. Yeah. I'm glad that she found her Savior. We see her salvation, her submission, we see her sanctification in the greatest missionary mother because she bore the greatest missionary, oh dear friend, that ever walked the face of the earth. And God uh, was interested uh, in these attributes of the life of Mary. You talk about a responsibility of being the one to carry the Messiah. And as we look this morning at these missionary mothers, i got a couple questions, and I'm going to ask them uh, to us this morning with the Lord's help. Question number one is simply this. Can God entrust you carrying Christ mm. to the world? Could he? In that day, could he have entrusted you? But today, if you're a born again believer, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. And God has given us the greatest commission that's ever been given to go into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. And can God entrust you to carry Christ to the world? As a mother this morning, many responsibilities, no doubt, have affected you, will affect you. But we must remember that we have a great commission to preach the gospel. And can God trust you? Can God entrust you? the great commission of carrying Christ to the world. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul makes the pressure of the Holy Ghost. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that is the will of God. We see Mary was living in that will of God. And that is the will of God for every mother today is to live a sanctified life that would uh, be trustworthy of God to be used to carry the gospel 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not looking for a dirty vessel today. God is not looking for an unclean vessel, but God is looking for someone who is clean and sanctified. Listen, we can't, there's no such thing as sinless perfection. We, every one of us today, will fail God in multiple areas before the day is over. But God is looking for holiness. And holiness is not checking off the list. Right. Of but holiness is a direction. Holiness is a seeking after God. Holiness is a submitted heart that says, Lord, I know I have you, but I want to do your will. I thank the Lord that God is still searching today for a group of mothers that would say, Lord, I want to be a missionary mother and carry Christ to those who have never heard. Now, as we continue to look for missionary mothers, we see a lady by the name of Eunice, that would have been Timothy's mother. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we talk about some great truths from the Word of God in this first chapter of 2 Timothy. And the Apostle Paul uh, is writing once again to Timothy in this second book. And uh, Paul was uh, Timothy's uh, father in the faith, so to speak. God had used Paul uh, to lead this young man to Christ. And he was discipling him. He was he was giving him instruction, but we see a glimpse in uh, chapter 1 and also chapter 3 into some of the upbringing of this young man named Timothy. In verse 3 of chapter 1, uh, Paul right in there, he said, I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with a pure conscience. Now without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Greatly desire to see thee and to be mindful and, and uh, be mindful of thy tears. That I, uh, and that I may be filled with joy. And in verse 5 he said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandfather Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, I am persuaded that in thee also. We see that there has been a godly lineage, there has been a godly heritage passed down to this young preacher boy named Timothy. And God is using Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost to give us a little bit of uh, insight into the lineage and the faithful uh, work that God had accomplished down not only through Timothy's mother, but Timothy's grandmother. We see that there was a grandmother before there was ever that mother, and she passed that unfaith faith down uh, to Timothy's mother. And we see nice that she had that faith, and she passed it down to Timothy. And what Paul is saying is, Timothy, I see the same faith that your mother had. She saw some faith in your grandmother. And I see that same faith in you. Look what God's Word tells us in chapter 3, verse 14. We know in verse 13, God said, The evil men and seducers shall act worse and worse. And is that not happening today? Deceiving and being deceived. But look what he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child. Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, God had allowed Timothy to be raised in such a background, in such a home, that when the gospel was presented to him, it didn't take a whole lot of thinking and pondering and wondering about the matter. Because from a child, he had been taught the Holy Scriptures. Amen. So he would have come under the preaching of the Apostle Paul. But it was probably almost like everything that Paul was preaching was reinforced. Because from a child, he had done know. He wasn't being taught something new. Right. I and mean, when a missionary steps out and goes to a foreign land, many of the time he's starting at ground zero. He has started at the very basic principles, but not with this young man named Timothy. He already knew the scriptures. And for God to take that young man that already knew the word of God. And he, he now we don't know a whole lot about his father's side. But we do know about his grandmother. And we know about his mother. They had pure faith. Unfeigned faith. There wasn't anything showy about their faith. They weren't worshiping and living for God because they wanted the praise of men. It was unfeigned faith. It was unpolluted faith. It was pure faith. And they were living for God because they loved God. Then what they did for God, they did it out of a pure heart with a pure motive. 
me. Paul said, I can see that same thing in you, Timothy. I can see it. I can see it. And here's why. Because from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scripture. And what was the result of that? God said they were able to make me wise unto salvation. Why? Now, being raised in a Christian home didn't save you anything. Right. But it led to his salvation. And, and I wonder this morning, not only as the mothers and our this today, can, can God entrust you to carry the can God entrust you to carry Christ to the world? But can God trust you to raise a Christian? Not only can God trust you to carry Christ to others, but can God trust you and entrust you to raise a Christian? For his glory. We see Timothy's mother raised a Christian. We raised a man that became a Christian. Raise someone who knew the Lord of God. Raise someone who had already instructed in the things of God. And you know what's amazing? How, how God allows Timothy's ministry to carry on after the Apostle Paul was already dead and gone. But I wonder if Timothy would have been half the preacher that God let him be had he not had a mother who had faith, who would walk with God, who yeah. trusted God, and raised him in the scriptures. You talk about uh, you talk about some missionary mothers, no doubt. This dear woman, nice as she was, a missionary mother. I can't help but think about missionary mothers without thinking over there in the book of Exodus, chapter yes. two. Yes. You talk about now this man named Moses. Old Moses, he had a mother, didn't he? Oh, oh yeah. He had a great mother. Turn yes. to Exodus chapter two. Exodus chapter two. Let's look at this dear lady. Second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 2. And we'll begin reading there in verse 1. Exodus chapter 2, in verse 1. The Bible said in there, went out a man of the house of Levi, and he took a wife of the daughters of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. And when she could no longer have him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes. God was slimed with pitch, put the child therein. And she laid it, she laid it by the flags of the river's bank, and his sister stood afar off to win what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself in the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among uh, the flags, she sent her maiden to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby went. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call me a nurse of the Hebrew women? She may nurse the child for thee. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go! And the maiden went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, for she said, Because I drew him out. I drew him out of the waters. And you see some background of this passage of Scripture was taking place. Pharaoh has already commanded the midwives and tried to get them to kill uh, the, the babies, assume the, the men and children as soon as they're born. Verse 21 of chapter 1, and it came to pass because the midwives feared God. God made them houses, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river. And right. the are, ye shall save, save life. And isn't it amazing today uh, that the same ungodliness and wickedness that is taking place in our country today, mothers want to kill their unborn babies. Mothers wanting to kill their newborn babies. It was taking place oh, thousands of years ago. We can go back that far in history. Uh, we can go back all the way to the days of Pharaoh. And here is a wicked king who is telling his people, I want those young children who have just been born, I want you to cast them in to the river. I want you to kill them. I want you to do away with their life. I want you to end their life. And you know, there's no new thing 